You're listening to the Reversing Climate Change podcast by the team at Nori, the carbon removal marketplace. This is a show about the innovators and entrepreneurs developing solutions to climate change. Hello, and welcome to the Reversing Climate Change podcast. My name is Christoph Jospe. Ross, I missed you. I get to do this one with you. It's been a minute yeah, sitting here with Ross Kenyon. You've just been doing it in Denver the whole time and I'm not there that often. So I miss them all. I know. I took a trip to Kansas. Uh, you know, here we are. It's kicking off a really exciting week for us in Oakland or Berkeley or the Bay or I don't know, losing track of everything. <laughs> We're in Berkeley right now. That's what happens when yeah. you come here, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, Ross, how about you introduce our guest? Sure. We are very excited to have with us today, Nathaniel Johnson, senior writer at Grist. Nathaniel, we have followed your work for a long time. You've been on our list of people. It's like next time we're in the Bay, we got to do a show. I'm, I'm glad you, you sought me out. Yeah. Thanks for, for joining us. Well, Christoph wanted to ask you about Nevada City. He, he was talking my ear off about, all I know is Joanna Newsom's from there, right? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. How do you know of Nevada City and what do you think of when you think of it? <laughs> Yeah, I like this, Christoph. How, how much should I expose about my personal <laughs> life and the sorts of events I go to? I don't know. Like, there's a subculture. There are people who are free thinkers. You have on the back of your book that you were raised by hippies. Yeah. So... That probably has something to do with it. But it, how did Nevada sh City shape you as a yeah. human being? So I was born here in Berkeley at home, you know, as all good hippies are. That's how we're hatched. And then when I was about four, my parents decided that uh, this was just too dense and too big of a city. And I was starting to fall down. I had a little brother as well and skin our knees on the concrete and you know, that was this intrusion of technology upon all that was good and natural, you know, injuring children. And so my parents needed to move somewhere softer. So we went up, <laughs> got back to the garden and moved up to Nevada City, which... Full Joni Mitchell, huh? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Which is a place that, you know, I, some people have heard of and is, it essentially evolved because Allen Ginsberg and Gary Snyder bought some land up there and all of these beats and hippies and sort of bohemian free thinkers started who were similar to my parents before th their time started to move up there and and buy land and so as is the case in many rural places around big cities you have this this mix of the rednecks and the hippies coming together and clashing and getting married and their ideas commingling and weird things happening but yeah it's it's this it's this wonderful place to grow up it's beautiful um, so how did, how did it shape the way that I thought? I mean, it's, it has a huge influence on me and my first book, All Natural is really sort of about that because there was this sense that we're in this place where these refugees of this modern world gone crazy. We kind of know better than other people that there's, there, the world is messed up and and we're out. But there's there's this frustration that comes with it, that as well, because it's sort of like you're waiting for everybody. You're sort of disempowered, right? Because you're waiting for everybody else to realize that too and, you know, get out as well. And you can't really influence them because you've, you're in this, you know, we're, you're, you're just sitting there complaining, meanwhile, driving around in your petroleum powered car and all the rest. So, so there's this weird tension between this feeling that the rest of the world is running blindly into madness and, and its own destruction and an inability to, to influence it. So essentially, this the first book was about, you know, here's this idea that we've missed something about progress, that we're blind to all the ways in which our progress is hurting us. And what we really need to do is get back to the garden to be be more natural that what's what's natural is healthy and good and we need to embrace that and so the first book is really just about trying to figure out you know is that true taking this thing that i i love and feel deeply to my core and being sympathetic but also scientifically rigorous with it and i guess it, you know when you ask what how, how that influences me it's like that is really my entire career then you know it's sort of like <laughs> yes we need to save the world yes we're destroying the planet let's figure out how to do it in such a way that we can actually change things and let's let's be skeptical and and rigorous in our approach it's a very good introduction because and let me know if this is an unfair appendage to apply on to you but i see you as sort of a progressive contrarian where you're on the team 
but you're also willing to check them when they when they support things that you might not think is very wise. Or maybe it sounds really good. But you're like, I, I, I did rigorous investigative journalism. And I've decided that actually this is a terrible strategy. Please do not do this, progressives. And so that's what you're trying to do. You, your sympathies are there, but you also try to steer it in the right kind of way. Yeah. I mean, I I don't think of myself as a contrarian just because I think of that word being as like someone who's going out and looking for a fight. Like I imagine someone in a bow tie who's just like, ah, ha, ha, I got you, you know. Uh-huh. I know those guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've all been to those dinner parties. But really doing this from from a place of love and concern and also just a sense of you know, wanting to be interesting, you know, wanting to ask the questions that will get real results. When I was a teenager in Nevada City and starting to figure out, okay, what am I going to do with my life? What's the, what's the big thing that I can work on? And I started going to these various groups and it was basically, you know, a bunch of hippies getting together and telling each other the same thing over and over again. And I just started to get bored with, you know, it's like, yes, we know we've, we've all read from this Bible. We've, we, we know, we know this spiel. <laughs> Isn't it more interesting to go out and, and ask if perhaps some of those core beliefs are wrong? Where is the evidence that is going to allow us to, to push forward and take the next steps rather than sort of just hammering home the dogma over and over again? So what, sort of experiences did you have that shook your core beliefs to the core that made you reassess things that maybe you learned in your experience in Nevada City, but then had some experience that made you see the world a little bit differently? There's lots of little ones, right? So as a storyteller, I really like the model of, you know, there's this one big road on to Damascus moment, right? <laughs> that changes everything. But in real life, real life doesn't work well with narrative. But I can think of I think can think of tons of little ones. Like one is that combination of the rednecks and hippies, you know, hanging out with friends before Nevada City was a, now it's sort of a cultural and marijuana town. But before that, it was a gold mining town and then a, a lumber town. And so some of the parents of my friends had worked in the lumber industry before that died off. And, you know, spending time with those people in the woods and just, talking with them, these, these lovely people who are like, okay, fine, you know, it's over, you know, we lost, <laughs> you're against logging, I get that, but you seem to really like wood. <laughs> if, you, if you look around, we're, we're sitting here in my uh, dining room and, you know, there's old growth redwood all around us. There sure is. There's, yeah. uh, you know, this is the big leaf maple on the dining table here, you know, which is a, a native tree from around here. People like me tend to really love this stuff. This redwood has been here since 1914. You know, it's it's locking up this carbon for all this time. It's this really cool material, but in order to get it, you have to cut down trees. And so that was that was something like, how would we do this sustainably? How would we start to think of logging as something that we could actually support as environmentalists in certain situations? That's one of these examples where instead of just being like, oh yeah, logging is bad. How do we work with this the right way? Another example is my first job after I graduated from college. I got a newspaper job in a small town in southern Idaho, surrounded by giant industrial farms run by conservative Mormon farmers. This wasn't one specific thing, but just seeing the way that they worked, seeing the efficiencies that they got out of the land, seeing the the way that they could produce so much food in so little space was interesting and seeing that they were they were people who i respected they weren't crazy people out to just rake in clouds of of money they they were really trying to be as responsible as possible while they were producing food for the rest of the world so there's yeah i guess there's lots of little things like that yeah your articles on topics like this have generated a fair amount of criticism um, I had to walk by a bodyguard on the way in here, <laughs> Just kidding, but it, that didn't happen. But no, a lot of your work has written about the nuances of nuclear energy and in which cases that may or may not be justified. I was wondering if maybe that's the first controversial topic we can get. What's the latest on, on nuclear? Well, nuclear energy is something that's, it's not like there's, it moves slowly. It's not, it's not like there's a ton of, of new stuff out there. There are these new models of, you know, 
the next generation of nuclear reactors that they're trying to bring online. But even those are things that they're really resurrecting from the 60s and 70s. They're things that they initially tried and then basically they went to these water reactors, which were really chosen because they were good reactors to put in nuclear submarines where you're, you're surrounded by water all the time. I've always heard this too about the the choices in nuclear have gone the direction that they have because of their synergy with weapons manufacturing and nuclear weapons. Is that true or is that just like a myth someone has told me at a party? I think it's, I think it's certainly true insofar as it's bundled with the military industrial complex. You know, mm -hmm. it's the reason we really needed nuclear power to begin with was because the military said they wanted it. They wanted nuclear submarines that didn't have to go back and refuel. They wanted nuclear aircraft carriers. And that was the that was the initial client. It's interesting if you go back to the early history of nuclear energy, there are all these people out like running around looking for use cases. Like we've got these things. What what the heck do we do with them? You know? And so at one point they were trying to blow up nuclear bombs in these tiny island towns in Alaska to create harbors. And there's this great story about that where the, the native people really were much more savvy than the Washington bureaucrats gave them credit for and, and recorded all these conversations and the, did this big expose and stopped it from happening. And to answer your question, yes, there's not necessarily so much with nuclear bombs. It's sort of a different path. I mean, the, the same ancestor, but the, it branches off fairly early. But certainly with the military industrial complex. I think there's a strong relationship there. So Nathaniel, can you lay it out for us, the debate around nuclear today? What are people who are pro or against nuclear even talking about? Well, they're talking about many different things and they're often not talking in ways that connect to each other, you know, these as these debates often do. You know, one person is talking north-south, another person is talking east-west. I guess the easiest way to lay this out is to just look at what we're facing in terms of climate change. The IPCC says that if we want to have any chance of sticking to the 1.5 degree warming region, we need to keep the nuclear energy that we have going basically for as long as possible. And many of the scenarios that they use involve building quite a bit more nuclear energy. So, I mean, it's, it's one of these things that it's like, when you look at the at the raw numbers, it's just it's the biggest form of non-carbon energy that we have in many countries. And so to get rid of it is is a problem. So I, I think of like uh, Leah Stokes, who's a professor at UC Santa Barbara, who's been analyzing all these Democrats, different climate policies. And so she sort of she found this and she's like, oh, crap, like I have to <laughs> I have to break this to my lefty friends that that if we can, if we can't just get rid of nuclear, it makes the problem a lot harder. And, you know, she, so she did this at this like Green New Deal conference where they were bringing people in to figure out what to do. And now she's like, what the heck happened? Now I'm like the nuclear person because I'm, <laughs> there's this thing that happens that when, when you're willing to go into these things and just like look at the data and not just go with the conventional wisdom because you've done that, then you kind of become the nuclear person. So there's, there's, <laughs> so, you know, she, like me, is just one of these people that kind of wants to deal with this problem and sees the fact that if you eschew this technology entirely, it's going to be a near impossible challenge. Now, there's all kinds of grays in there. You know, do you keep what we have open for as long as possible, but look for ways to wind it down while you're scaling up new technologies, figuring out fusion, figuring out geothermal, these other kinds of technologies that can fit the same niche. But the, the fundamental issue is that you have these renewables that, that go up and down, that we don't control, we don't flip the switch on. And as we get to deep penetration of those renewables, we're going to need something else that we can flip the switch on. It could be storage, but we, that's also something that we, we haven't figured out. We need, we need more technology on. So one thing that we do have is nuclear that could possibly be the answer. But the real problem is it's hugely unpopular. People hate it. So I, I see the, the next generation of nuclear power as being, you know, several Democratic candidates have embraced this idea, but it's more of like a PR thing. Like here, here's this thing that's, this could be a different version. You know, all that 
animosity you feel toward nuclear power. That's this old stuff over here. We're going to do something different with this new stuff and it'll be great. <laughs> I don't think that'll actually work, but it'll be interesting to see. Old nuclear and new nuclear TM. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why do you think nuclear has such a bad rap? I don't know nearly enough ab about it to like, don't quote me listener and say Ross Canyon said it was a great idea because I'm yeah. not really that smart on this stuff. <laughs> but it seems like the numbers I've seen for deaths caused um, like per kilowatt hour, however they measure it, nuclear is super low. Uh, the impact is really, really quite high. We should probably be building more of these. There's next generation technology that's sort of locked up. And my understanding too is, and multi, multi nested question here, Nathaniel, you can take in any direction you want, is that sometimes people say nuclear is just too expensive relative to other types of renewables. And I never know to what degree that's, I've heard it's basically impossible to ensure new nuclear and that the, the DOE, Department of Energy, um, makes it rather difficult. They have requirements that you have to get insurance, one specific type of insurance that they have to pay a lot of money for. But it's interesting because they, uh, the nuclear industry has to pay for this insurance, but it's also seen as a subsidy because if there ever was a nuclear disaster, it would overwhelm this insurance and then, you know, there would be a bailout. And, you know, so, ah. so it's, it's this weird thing where it's, yes, it's a subsidy because we're requiring them to buy into this insurance and the people are going to bail them out if there ever is a disaster, which, you know, there hasn't been in the United States. On the other hand, it's a subsidy where the nuclear industry has paid millions and millions of dollars over the year and, and not gotten anything in return. So it's a, it's a strange kind of subsidy. Yeah. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. No, and thanks for, for clarifying. And that answers some of the questions I was, I was going to ask on that, which is how much of nuclear's non-prominence relative to other types of renewables right now as a result of market forces versus various policy levers that have been pulled against it or maybe just not for it? Yeah, it's hard to separate those two. I went back, I, I read several books. There's a great book called Collapse of an Industry by the sociologist looking at the nuclear industry and what happened. And he does this wonderful nuanced job, but it looks like the the biggest, there, there are many interlocking factors, right? But the biggest thing has to do with local opposition to that land use. You know, you want to put a nuclear plant, you know, right here across the street, people are going to oppose it. And then that starts to interact with the regulatory apparatus, which is you know, what's be super careful about this. So then it takes years and years, it gets more and more expensive. And then that starts to interact with the market and the manufacturing forces. So because it got so hard to build nuclear power plants, the whole engine ground to a halt. And so now they're, you know, they, they, said, let's build a couple more. They tried to build one in um, Georgia. There, it's probably will get completed. There's another one in South Carolina that will not get completed. And what they found when they did that was that the entire pipeline had collapsed. So nobody knew how to do it. There were these crazy delays. You know, they were they're putting things, these major elements in upside down and had to, you know, spend, you know, just a cool billion dollars to pull that out and flip it over. And, you know, just this, these, these horrific things where they didn't have the expertise. They had to like, you know, manufacture on site, these specific little parts. You're just saying, cause there's no industry to support this anymore. There's, there's no industry. Demand. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's no industry to support it. There's no expertise mm -hmm. um, to figure out how to do it. There's, you know, there is the regulatory intensity so that people have to be super careful and everything has to slow down and which I think is good, you know, let's get this right. It's also an incredibly, I mean, let's not be one-sided. It's incredibly complex technology. Technologies that are simple tend to get cheaper. And this is something where you have to have backups upon backups upon backups, you know, especially because we're, we're designing these things that are made to be underwater. And so because we're, they're not in submarines, you have to pump water up to always, and this water is going to evaporate if you lose power. So you have to have these backup systems on top of, you know, to get the water there. So it's, it's, it, you know, and you have to keep people out. So there's not these terrorist threats to come in and steal the radioactive materials. Very complicated. It takes a lot of, a lot of layers of safety to deal with. And that's, that just makes every new reactor go $10 billion over budget. 
except in and you can talk more to Ted Nordhaus about this because they've they've done some interesting stuff in South Korea where there has been a more constant industry and the prices have actually gone down. Wow, is this is what you're describing part of the older gigantic infrastructure nuclear reactors? Because I know there's much that are yep. just very small though that are. I keep hearing about them, but I yeah, don't know. no, that's uh, so. The next generation of nuclear reactors, there's these small modular reactors that are moving through the regulatory pipeline, um, and people are very excited about them or worried about them, as the case may be. And they will come out, but they're sort of this thing that's been promised for a million years and have not happened. But they, I think, they're going to. They're the question is, will those be? any more cost effective. And I think the argument is because they're small, because they're modular, you could solve some of these complexity problems. You could you could solve some of the, you know, on-site artisan uh, engineering problems. But that all depends on there being enough of a pipeline, enough of a demand for them, enough local acceptance that they start getting built and put into places. Um, and that's a problem that no one's tackled. It's like that in cold fusion. There's a, I've seen this attributed to Charles de Gaulle about Brazil is the country of the future and always will be. Right. And that's how I feel sometimes with some of this nuclear tech. I'm like I've been hearing about this since I think like high school or middle school and uh, still not here. So 20 years later, you learned about it on the Simpsons, right? Ross? That, I think that was like basically everyone's first contact uh, <laughs> with nuclear probably. Yeah. What's, what do you think is the, okay, so we, we've laid out some of the positive things about nuclear energy. You can either speak from what actually bothers you, or you can invent it if you think it's actually nonsense. But what do you think is the best case against pursuing a nuclear future? Well, I think the strongest argument is, is sort of a social science argument that there's, there's a lot of these things in the world or in the heads of very bright, rational engineers that make perfect sense in black and white. And, you know, you can, you can look at the deaths per kilowatt hour and say like, yes, this has the lowest deaths per kilowatt hour, but that, that has no bearing on the way that normal people's brains works. It's very nerdy, exactly. abstract way to think. Yeah. Exactly. You know, we don't think about the, the number of deaths per mile per gallon of gasoline that we get from our cars. You know, these are these horrific death machines that put just about everything else in our lives to shame. Which you know? cars. Yeah, cars. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That we're, you know, we sacrifice our children to. It's like 40,000 people a year in the United States die from auto accidents. Let alone like the local health hazards of just smog and pollution yeah. from congestion. And not mentioning the climate effects. Oh, right. That's sort of I've inconvenient. Heard about those. Carbon, <laughs> carbon dioxide, <laughs> pesky little yeah, we, molecule there. But people don't register that as so much of a risk for a couple of reasons. Because it's under our control, because we see immediate benefits to ourselves, and because it's it's something that we can kind of see and understand. So there's this transparency, there's this control, and there's personal benefit. When you look at the risk science, the things that people fear the most are the things that are the opposite of all of those things. Things that are out of your control, that are controlled by some giant corporation or, or government that you have no ability to influence. Things that you don't understand. Things that may bring some benefit to you, but do it in this circular way that don't bring immediate benefit that you get to make a choice about the trade-offs on. And nuclear power ticks every one of those boxes. Here's this strange thing that's hard to comprehend that, you know, some corporation with a crazy name like Drax or Exelon is under control. It sounds <laughs> ominous. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that, that you don't get to, to weigh the costs and benefits yourself, that, that this is being done at a societal level or in some, I guess it wouldn't be a smoke filled room now, but like a, a vape filled room. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think in those upper echelons of board meetings, they're all... <laughs> <laughs> what are, yeah, what are they talking? Popping on their jewels. Yeah, yeah. there's like, not like vape cigars yet for that. Yeah. Good image though. Very yeah. comedic. So I, I think that that's a real thing that the, the political economy for some of these things just might not work. And because of that, the economics, the economy economy might not work. Maybe for enough time that some other cleaner, better, less politically problematic solution will come into play. This is, this is uh, Dan Common's argument. He said, 
scientists at UC Berkeley just up the road. Is it Thinking Fast and Slow? Dan Kahneman? No, no, not Dan Kahneman. Uh, uh, Dan Kahneman. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, you got to... You it's too close. Yeah, your K, your K scientists are I still sound tricky. smart though, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> so he's like a, a real solar enthusiast who's not into nuclear power for this reason. He just sees by the time that we figure out these political questions, by the time we're able to make it cheap, we're going to have space mirrors. We're going to have solar panels floating in space with nanowires coming back to earth to provide us with power. You know, we're going to have these other, we're going to have fusion, you know? So he's, he's sort of like, I'm, I'm interested in, I think we should keep on researching it because we're going to need some power sources for our deep space missions. So that's, you know, that's kind of a fun use case. But yeah, it may well be that the only places that nuclear is going to work for new builds in the modern world will be places like China, where you have much more authoritarian governments who just kind of ram it through, yeah, which hard, is what's happening. It's hard to be a NIMBY when you have someone like that you're going up against. Hard to be a NIMBY in, in China right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tough going. Yeah. When I think of, of nuclear in the sort of like uh, atomic age and, and Eisenhower years in the fifties, I, I see it as sort of like the ultimate progressive vision and is this clean, abundant energy replacing like the dirtiness of the cities. And it's, it's strange to me that it, it just never came to fruition. I think most of it, I think you are right. I think most of it has been a PR failure with like three mile Island and it's much later, of course, and Chernobyl didn't help, but I think the nails were already in the coffin by that point. Yeah. I mean, I think of it less as, a, it's not like people did something wrong with PR. It's just these, these, there's these inherent issues that squid onto our brainstem in a way that make us react with dread and horror to this technology. Yeah. And that makes responsible for Godzilla, yep. at least. Yeah. yeah. We got that out of it. I mean, I certainly appreciate this about you as a journalist who's kind of fearless to ask the right questions, go into some topics that are certainly not black and white. Another topic you've written about are genetically modified organisms or GMOs. Watch out. This is going to get real spicy. This is a spicy one, listeners. And it's, you know, it's one of those things where people know what they think they know and hold these beliefs really, really steadfast. But what is a GMO? What's the deal with GMOs, Nathaniel? (laughs) How much time do we have? I mean, (laughs) so it's tricky because even the definition is squishy. Like I wrote an entire piece which was entitled is practically impossible to define GMO. So because technically a, a tomato is a genetically modified organism. It depends on how you're where you're going to draw the line, right? So is the line that things have changed that their genes have modified? Well, of course everything's doing that. We're evolving all the time. Is it that they've been changed by human influence, you know, are those devious mad scientists? Well, of course we've been doing that for since the beginning of agriculture and in selecting crops. Well, okay, but it's not that. Is it some is it about introducing other genes from other species into another species? Well, if you if you define it that way, you have to take into account that this is happening naturally in the world all the time where you have this this horizontal gene flow from viruses and you know you you have insects sucking on on one thing and you know putting a rice gene into a barley plant you know these crazy it's it's sort of if you approach it with an air of curiosity rather than morality it's it's kind of boggling and wonderful to see how messy the things that we think of as separate species are you know throughout history there's it's just this wild stuff where we've just been just been smushing dna back and forth across the tree of life for the last 2 billion years so what it really comes down to, I think, in people's minds is it's sort of like the same risk analysis that happens with nuclear. What it is, is it's a GMO is something that someone I don't really trust in probably in a lab coat did in a high tech looking room and was motivated purely by profit to do so. So what it really is about is it's it's a marker. You know, I, I talk about GMOs as, as a metaphor. It's like anything that feels like it's out of my control in this world of corporate food that I can't really trust. That's almost a better way to think about it. I mean, the, the actual definition, if you get into like the US government, has to do with um, transgenesis, which means taking humans, taking one gene from one species and putting it into another species. Again, then there's even problems with that because when you scramble DNA by exposing seeds to radiation or you know bathing them in, in toxic chemicals, 
you know, that's something that people tend to avoid, but that's something that we use for, for seeds that are used in organic agriculture as well. So the, <laughs> it's very, it's very complicated. You're like the, the physical embodiment of the actually meme guy. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> my worst nightmare yeah but, but uh, I, no, if, the, if that's true i'll take it no the details of these things uh matter quite a lot and i do think it's more of a political marker than it is merely someone who dug in and yeah they don't trust monsanto or they don't trust some of these big companies that have their best interests in mind and of course and then this sort of we talked about this a little bit before but uh in jonathan heights moral foundations theory one of one of the main pillars of it is uh, sanctity and sort of both nuclear in it, the way that it causes mutations and, and radiation. I think that fits into this too. And then GMOs is deliberately changing the, the natural processes, these genes. I think it, there's something about it that just rubs people and it isn't a conservative uh, uh, or a left-wing thing. It just seems like we all have this as one of our intuitions that we either have to serve or fight against. And even if this was perfectly safe, you even have very smart people like Nassim Taleb, not into GMOs. Oh man, is he not? Not into GMOs one bit. And uh, yeah, a lot of this is for precautionary principles, which I know you've written about it and like to argue against. So why don't you lay it out for us? Can well, you start with defining what is the precautionary principle? Well, I wish I wish I knew. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't do anything for any reason to anyone. Uh, this is the Michael Scott answer. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's sort of the danger of the, often when the precautionary principle is wheeled out, it's, it's really by people that just want to shut something down. Rhetorically, it's very useful. Right, exactly. It's like, well, if in its most extreme, it's saying if something might have some negative effect, you have to prove that that negative effect won't occur before you introduce it into the world. Well, that's impossible. You know, you do that and you stop all growth and all innovation. You stop all, you know, learning. <laughs> if you if you apply that to, to culture, gosh, you know, you stop reading books, you know, that definition is very problematic. And there's, you know, there's various regulatory bodies like the the various UN, there's huge tracks that are really boring that you can read about this where they say, well, it's not quite that. We we want to we want to look at these things and, you know, make some good choices. You know, if you define it that way, I have no problem with it. The thing that I like to think of is we need to be precautionary in our choices about introducing new things into the world, but we also need to be precautionary about the status quo. The status quo right now is is really not good. Dude, that's the reverse Uno card right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just got played. <laughs> in in a lot of ways. And so if you're saying let's let's just stick with what we have until we can prove that anything new isn't going to hurt us, then we're stuck in this status quo that's that's heading at, you know, 400 miles per hour towards 6 degrees of global warming, which I'm not willing to accept. There's a real need for, you know, not blindly rushing into things, but we have to weigh that against the need to make some real changes. What's that got to do with GMOs? Like, oh, right. what, what are some good reasons to to support it? What, what can they do with climate change? Well, and what are the genuine risks too? Give us the best case for it. I want, I want to make you, I want to make you the GMO guy, the people who you fight with. I want you to represent them. Yeah, or just like at least convince me why when I'm in the supermarket I should or shouldn't buy GMO free. Like why should I or should not care? So I started out. You know, I started out carrying a lot before I started researching this. They didn't really have the GMO free label, but now I really don't choose based on that at all. The more research I do on agriculture, the kind of less I'm concerned with these consumer facing labels. And it's been wonderfully freeing to, <laughs> to not have to worry about them. But again, trying to skate over the surface without diving into too many details as I've already done to our peril today a couple of times. Don't but, worry. We've trained our listeners. They like it. <laughs> but just to, one way to kind of get at the big picture is to think about what would agriculture look like without GMOs? And it wouldn't look that different. It's not a foundational technology of industrial agriculture. You know, part of, I think part of the opposition is just this idea that like, we get rid of this thing and We'll have these beautiful, aesthetically pleasing small farms where I can, you know, do a, a 50 mile bike ride up to and have this wonderful meal and that will be the world. And that just, that won't happen. There's plenty of technologies. There's farmers that use GMO and non-GMO crops side by side. 
not for ideological reasons, just because you know one happens to be the right price at the right year. It wouldn't change things that much. You know, you'd have you'd have people spraying less glyphosate because glyphosate is Roundup. That's what many of the GMO crops are organized around because they're Roundup resistant crops. But then they'd be spraying a lot more of other herbicides and other more toxic herbicides. Farmers would be using less BT crops. So the main two GMOs are Roundup resistant and BT. BT is a bacteria that's used in organic farming a lot to kill certain insects. You can you can spread it on your broccoli and these these worms will eat it and then they'll die. So BT crops have this little crystal that the bacteria produce engineered into them so that when these worms eat them, you know, it's toxic to the worms, it's not toxic to humans, they die. So you get rid of those and farmers, so you wouldn't have GMO insecticides, but you'd have farmers using more actual insecticides. So not a huge change. The problem about sort of defending GMOs and being like, what could they do is that there's not great examples because there's enough regulatory hurdles. It's it's so hard to produce one of these things, get it through all of the testing and get it on the market that only the Monsantos can do it. So there were a lot of these little startups that had great ideas way back when, and they sort of got either bought up by the Monsantos and the DuPonts, or they they realized that they we're just going to go out of business. So the only things that are produced are the things that are going to appeal to giant farmers that they can be sort of sold across the board. So there there are lots of cool things out there, you know, you could engineer crops that produce more per acre and which takes, you know, would take pressure off surrounding forests. There's some really interesting work being done on engineering soil bacteria to produce fertilizer for crops. Um, so you're not putting synthetic fertilizer on and it's just producing a little spurt right when the plant needs it rather than putting a lot on all at once that then gets washed downstream. I think if you had the innovators sort of freed up to experiment with this, there would be a lot of use cases that would be kind of cool. But as it is, it's sort of this like, yeah, it helps make industrial farming a little bit more efficient, which is kind of like, you know, this, yay. <laughs> um, <laughs> like golf clap. Yeah. I mean, what, you know, it's, I mean, it, it is important. I mean, it's not useful for, from PR perspective because, you know, people don't understand how important industrial farming is to the overall footprint of humanity on the world. And if you can make it a little bit more efficient, it has these huge environmental savings. And there, there are things that are used by, you know, you have small, very poor farmers in Bangladesh right now that now have access to BT eggplant who have gone from being out there with bare arms and legs spraying horrendously toxic pesticides two or three times a week. You really have to spray eggplant a lot to really not having to so spray at all. Biorganic organic eggplant is what you're saying. Well, this is, this is a GMO eggplant. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or yeah, organic or GMO eggplant. But it's, it's less about the consumer. By the time it gets to the consumer, the pesticides are much less of an issue. It's really, it's really about the, the farm workers where this is hurting. So the point is there, there are these use cases out there that I'm more interested in, but they're, they're kind of these small marginal cases, eggplant in Bangladesh, papaya in Hawaii, these things that are less foundational to our food system. That's a good point. One of those questions with regard to GMOs that one should be asking is what would they be doing were it not for this technology? And if it's worse, that's a good reason to evaluate it. Right. I'm really enjoying this conversation. There's too much here, though. <laughs> I, I should have just let you just just do GMOs or just do nuclear. Yeah. There's too too much to split. Yeah, we just have to come and hang out with you off air, Nathaniel. That's basically the answer. <laughs> Anytime, but, man. <laughs> uh, you've talked a lot. I mean, so like, clearly you have a perspective in farming. You've worked in southern Idaho. You've worked directly. You've reported on farming. You've reported on industrial agriculture. You've got this book here, All Natural. I see that Rodale published it. So mm -hmm. you've sort of in like the all camps which is really cool like yeah. that's that's how you can really understand the levers of change and systemic change now so nori i mean we're a carbon removal marketplace we've developed a methodology that helps farmers monetize incremental gains in soil organic carbon soil carbon is sexy right now 
got to credit uh, Jeremy Kaufman on our earlier podcast for SEQ, sequestration, C. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Soil carbon Ooh. is sexy. Yeah. But you wrote an article that threw a bit of shade at it. You said it's a little bit overhyped right now. Where's that coming from? Yeah. How dare you? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm here to uh, throw sand into the, the wheels of Nori, really. Uh, no, I think, I mean... We'll turn that into pearls. Yeah, there you go. I think it's caught the imagination of a bunch of policymakers. You have all these Democratic presidential nominees, or not, what are they, candidates, talking about how we're going to just sequester tons and tons of carbon in the ground, and it's going to solve the problems of rural poverty and climate change in one stroke. And I just didn't want to get too carried away in that vein. So I, I went and I talked to a bunch of soil scientists and I was like, so what's real and what's not here? And basically what they said is, we know how to do this. These basic techniques of cover cropping, of minimizing tillage, of incorporating organic material back into the ground as much as possible, do sequester carbon. Like that's, it works. The question is, how much can we get and how long can we maintain those gains? And does it tail off at any point? Do we do they start to do you start to fill up the bathtub at some point um, where you've got these degraded soils that for you know the last century we've been we've been hauling carbon out of it in the form of grain and selling it across the world? You fill that up again. Where does that get you? And I think those those questions aren't fully answered. There's some there's some interesting estimates that people have made. So we can get a lot of good from this. We can certainly get carbon back into the soil. It's great to have people who are taking that externality and bringing that back into the market. I wish I wish they would show up. I don't know where they are. Um, but I do get a little concerned when I hear people like the Democratic candidates or like uh, Alan Savory saying, we can just solve this problem. We can keep flying around and polluting. We can just get regenerative grazing going and we're good. I think that's the danger. It's fair to say that some of the claims that we see are a bit Pollyanna for the potential of soils. And we're, we're agnostic. So we've started with regenerative ag and cropping soils, but we're also big industrial carbon capture people too. And we're looking forward to that and sort of all of the above. What's weird though, is that people who are really into soil stuff tend to think it's the only thing necessary, or they've so isolated it from all the other sol solutions in the solution set that uh, it just seems unrealistic to me. I don't think that's specific to people working in anyone, like anyone who's working on one solution is going to be like, <laughs> forestry, trees are the best way to draw down carbon. Okay, that's a fair point, yeah. No, marine permaculture. No, but you should really look at aggregate. Um. <laughs> well, this, this is, that's sort of the, the question that I had, and it sort of echoes a lot of the things that we were talking about, because I've noticed in, you know, I live here in the Silicon Valley area, and with startups, there's this interesting tension and I'm, I'm curious how you handle this yourselves between being, we're young, we know that we're ignorant, we're going to fail early and fail often and learn from failures, we're going to pivot, we're going to listen, and then also having to do the marketing and having to say, we have got this world changing idea. We are a unicorn. We've got it. It, it seems like those things are in conflict. I wonder if you like, how do you navigate that yourself? Do you find yourself having to put on different hats for, in different situations? I'd say sometimes, but I mean, the podcast that you're on right now, this started as in, as a way to educate people about what we're trying to do. And we also, we say goofy stuff on here sometimes that doesn't always portray ourselves in our smartest light when we're, we're learning and we try to be transparent. And we're also trying to innovate on multiple different frontiers simultaneously that all need it. And we've brought people along for the ride. So that's at least a major reason why we've done the podcast. And we try to be pretty, we make some big claims or we have big ideas, but I think we also try to be humble about how we present it to, maybe we don't always succeed at it, but that's sort of how I think about it. Not to bore our listeners, but I'll give a hot take update on our business strategy. Cause I think it's, it's part of it. It's like, yes, we're, we're in tech stars right now. And one of the mottos in tech stars is do more faster. And we have certainly been looking at like, what are the micro experiments that we can learn from and then adopt accordingly? I mean, there's no question that Nori's business model is valid. The world is going to need an atmospheric cleanup service. And that's where we're positioning ourselves. We're a carbon removal marketplace. We want to make it as easy as possible for people on one side to pay for that activity. And on the other side to 
basically generate a claim which is valid, people can trust it, and then they can monetize it. So I'm with you. the question comes down to how can we most efficiently do that and learn al along the way? And so well, like any two-sided marketplace, you've got the chicken and the egg, what came first? How do you build up both supply and demand at the same time? We've taken the strategy actually with a number of pilots by saying to farmers, if you adopted a switch since 2010 that began to draw down carbon, um, we'll actually create this one-time opportunity to monetize historic carbon removals and then sign a 10-year contract while you'll continue to do this. We've learned a bit from that strategy, but like generally it sticked the same and it's then how do you get the data in the most efficient way? And there are other podcasts where we've brought on someone like Emma Fuller, who works for farm management information software, Granular, that basically we're building an application programming interface between our platform and the farm platform so we can just get the farmer data and make it work. Then on the selling side... Like we're just figuring it out constantly. What's the easiest way to sell this to people who want it? And how do we learn from them and do that along the way? And I think the broader point as a newcomer into the carbon market space, we realize that we're not the only game in town. And we realize there are other places where people can buy carbon offsets or pay for some environmental activity. So what can we do that's like a step level change better, more efficient? And for us, that comes down to really boiling it down to being radically transparent about how we estimate and quantify carbon mm. dioxide removals through generating and producing open source methodologies that align with the incentives for people who have skin in the game. So we, from very early on, have been working very closely with a team at Colorado State University, which has been funded by the USDA, called Comet Farm. This is basically a USDA-approved carbon estimation tool based on the farm management practices that people are changing. So it's not Nori who's designing our own system. Actually, we're aligning with a third party. And yeah, it's totally learning by doing. I mean, that's part of why we do this podcast. Like Ross said, we we invite the listeners to like join us on this journey, be part, be a collective author in this broader story where if it's a voluntary carbon market where we're cutting our teeth initially, like over time, I mean, we're talking to California too. California could adopt part of our framework and we would be like, great, more shots on goal. Like, right. There's too much carbon. So yeah, all that's to say is, you know, move quickly. I think it was a strategic decision to start with projects here in the United States as opposed to overseas. It was a strategic decision to say start with agriculture because carbon markets to date have been inhospitable to farmers. And if we can just use software in an efficient way, like that'll make it easier. So I don't know. Were you also asking do? about like your original question that, that prompted this, which by the way, Christoph, I just got to cut that in there is just like a standalone, like insert Christoph here and I'll just send that to people if you want. Like what's the, <laughs> what's the latest on Nori? That was, that was quick. Um, but you're asking like, we're doing exciting things and we want to be conservative and accurate, but there's also a tension with marketing and talking about how great we are. Yeah. And approaching funders. Like, I, I wonder if you feel that. So if I'm to summarize the history of offsets, it's sort of a dumpster fire. You know, I, I support it. I think it's like our dumpster fire. It's better than any of the other <laughs> options out there. I think, I mean, I think, you know, there's huge problems with red. I don't even know the, what that stands yeah. for. What is it? But the deforestation, avoided deforestation. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's also better than not trying to do anything at all. And I think there's, there's some real important success stories with indigenous people and the Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. But do you ever feel like you have to sort of be like, we're confident. We know the right way to do this. We're we're stepping up the game. We're not going to make a mistake. And you can give us a you know a check for a billion dollars versus, um, gosh, like let's try this and see if it works, and we'll keep iterating and. I mean, it, make it depends on the hour. <laughs> yeah, but I think we have to we have to be humble about it. And I do think the word collective authorship is what it comes down to. It's let's write this story. If there's a better way to estimate and quantify carbon dioxide removal, let's be public about it. Let's, you know, poke holes in it. I think bravado is uh, pretty transparent too. Mm -hmm. And I think um, showing thoughtfulness about how we're approaching it and what we're learning is oftentimes being humble. is sort of like the ultimate confidence in a way. Like I know what I don't know. And I would hope that anyone wanting to work with us would respect that rather than just being like, I got it, man. I know everything there is to know about, about soil carbon. And yeah. Yeah. I don't know. People are like that. And, uh, I don't know. I'm sure you run into people like that all the time and you're like, all right, yeah, all right, I yeah, yeah. this guy's terrible. <laughs> well, I, I mean, the thing that, that is impressive for me is when there's, you know, everybody can say words when there's evidence that 
something's working, then that's that's exciting. So I really I'm that's what I'm this this sort of new wave of people who are trying to do what Nori is doing. I'm really excited for the when that starts, you, you get enough time to have like a solid sample set and they're like, we can really show a trend line here. That's going to be cool to see. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you one a final question and it could be a quick one if you'd like, but who do you think is your best critic? One of the questions we like to ask or we're trying to ask more often is who's the smartest person who disagrees oh, with you? Oh, yeah. You guys, you guys are about to go to talk to Ted Nordhaus and... His, Spoiler alert, listener. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. coming next week. I, you, you can keep that in there or cut it out as you, as you like. But his organization puts on these breakthrough dialogues, these conferences, and I've gone to a few of them. They're full of people who are thinking in very critical ways about, uh, about these questions. So I bump into those people there. And if I'm being a little bit overconfident or those people will, will call me back. So someone I think of is that I see there and who I sometimes bump into on Twitter is Tamar Haspel, who's a columnist at the Washington Post. And she is excellent, really thoughtful. We don't tend to disagree about that much, but sometimes we do. And it's it's super interesting to see. The critiques that hurt are are the ones that are not the ones that like you're an idiot, you know, everything you say is wrong, but the ones that are like, I think you're you're 75% right, but there's this one thing. <laughs> it's like, oh, you really read that closely. And so so I'll get that often from, you know, there's these farmer scientists yeah. that are on Twitter who but, but as a journalist, you want that, right? Exactly. Exactly. You you don't you don't learn and you don't make progress unless you have checks on yourself. There's like this guy, Terry Daynard, who's a farmer and scientist up in Canada who really doesn't like it when I critique farmers and you know he's he's very sharp and he'll he'll get me there's this and the sort of from the other side there's a farmer and lawyer in upstate New York who's really an advocate for small farmers and will critique me when I'm I'm saying something like gosh this impossible burger is pretty cool and they want to get rid of all meat production by 2030 She's saying, you really want to completely wipe out this way of life that um, we've been treasuring for uh, hundreds of years? Yeah. So there's there's some there are these people, and they're often you know it's not it's often reminding me of the science the science and like you, you might be rationally wrong about this, but it's often these more cultural heart related you know critiques that force me to think about things in emotional terms as well as as rational ones. That's a very good answer. And that question is also extremely difficult. I think we've stumped a couple people with it or just came out of left field. They're like, I don't know. <laughs> so well done. Let's do another one of these yeah, at some point. This was fun. There, there's more to talk about. Thanks so much for being here. If someone wanted to buy your books or or you also have a great Twitter handle uh, or follow you and uh, keep up, how should they do it? Yeah. So I'm at Savertooth, like Sabertooth Tiger, except Saver with a V, Sabertooth. <laughs> At Sabertooth on Twitter, I have a, a website where you can find that in my my books, which is uh, just nathanieljohnson.org. If you if you Google my name, it, I have a weird spelling of my name, but um, if you Google Nathaniel Johnson Grist, you'll you'll probably figure out the right spelling, and uh, it's N A T H A N A E L. Thank you, mom and dad, for <laughs> years and years. Of I had to study it, and make sure I got it right yeah. too. What are the parents doing to kids in Berkeley? Yeah, that's that's torture right there, you know. <laughs> but it does make me Google, you know, with a last name like Johnson, you know, you, you do need something a little bit unusual for your first name. So that's a, maybe a blessing in disguise. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you again, Nathaniel, for being here. And if you like the show, please rate and review us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or uh, Stitcher as well if you use that. And thank you so much for listening.